Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kivan Davani. Really excited, looking forward to my next special guest. Her name is Elizabeth Profontaine. You, some of you might have already heard of her on Twitter or maybe even found her by accident, such as myself on LinkedIn. I found her content really, really fascinating. Her, her articles are succinct uh, that she wrote. Uh, with it's called stalled innovation or powerful innovation Bitcoin or why Bitcoin is not a security. So uh, I'm not going to you know uh, dive into that too much detail. She's going to talk about that. I'm going to ask her you know about the background, the journey, her epiphany uh, uh, until she found Bitcoin. And what I really love about her content and her you know ethical principles and her vision and uh, comprehension is uh, her. You know her degree of of ethical principles. Her uh, the the journey she took. You know from the old legacy system, or would it be investment, capital markets, institutions, where she was amongst others, amongst other uh, positions she had. It was one of it. One of it was uh, head of sale, wealth sales at BlackRock, which, as far as I know, is a multi trillion dollar uh, institution. But so I'm going to ask her you know, a lot of questions about uh, what she thinks. I'm really excited to hear about her insights. Um, would it be, you know, the so-called uh, alternative, uh, <laughs> alternative coins or shit coins, as we call them, or the the legacy system of banks, central banks? Um, thanks again, you know, to uh, shout out to Tip uh, Thibault Marechal, my good friend of Canada, and. Uh, yeah, and this is what really fascinates me, the personal stories also of people who come from the old legacy, would it be capital investment uh, institutions, into this new, you know, totally evolutionary um, uh, space of Bitcoin with, uh, you know, with principles such as virus in numeris, do not trust, verify. And so she's the founder of Economics, it's an independent research and consultant firm dedicated to financial technologies. And uh, to check it out for yourself, it's octonomics.com. Read her articles, definitely worth reading. Um, and she says, according to her own website, more specifically interested in the fast evolving world of Bitcoin, its ecosystem and applications. And uh, she's established as an independent. Octonomics is free from any legacy business models and offers an unencumbered perspective on the current and emerging trends. So check her website out and we're looking forward without further ado. This is my interview with Elizabeth Prefontaine. She's also, you know, a prolific uh, speaker, keynote speaker, expert, researcher. And yeah, let me know what you think. Uh, if you have any questions, write me to hello at the totalconnect.com. Uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, what have you on YouTube. Give me a share. Uh, retweet it, like, it would really help me. Thank you so much for your support and for listening. And also make sure you check out again uh, the website and the articles, the blog of Elizabeth Profontaine. You can also follow her on Twitter. It's at Eprefon. That's E P R E F O N. We're going to put those in the show notes. Thank you so much for your support, for listening again. And without further ado, this is my interview with Elizabeth Fontaine. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. How are you doing? Hi, great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for your time. Um, so listen, Elizabeth, I, I'm, I, I stumbled upon you, right? I mean, by accident, sort of on LinkedIn, and then I, I got introduced to, to your articles. And somehow, you know, the world is really small. And and by the way, Tip, Thib our Bitcoin friend, Thibaut Marachal, also said hi to you from Canada. <laughs> And he forwarded one or two questions for you, but we can get that into, into that later. So I read all your articles, Elizabeth, uh, on your website or blog, octonomics.com. And I was really thrilled. I, it was really, I mean, succinct, um, you know, stylishly, perfectly written, eloquently. It's, it's amazing. Uh, so congratulations to your articles. Um, let, me, let me see if I can remember. So I, I read why Bitcoin is not a security stalled uh invention part one and part two and the third one was powerful innovation bitcoin correct correct okay correct good. thank you and thank you so much for reading my content yeah, yeah, I appreciate yeah. It. 
And I read each of those articles, I think two or three times, not because it was like too difficult. It was really so succinct, so beautifully written. I think for anybody, um, because you come from, and we're going to get into that and you, I'm going to let you, you know, introduce yourself and, uh, and, and maybe give a brief introduction to what's your journey, because I find your journey to Bitcoin, because you come from the legacy business capital investment market institutions, you also, as I heard, you know, I read you also were once uh, head of the wealth management, wealth sales at BlackRock, which is, I think, sort of a multi-trillion institution, right? It's the largest asset management firm in the world, correct? Yeah. So uh, what I really find fascinating about your whole approach and your, you know, your ethos is you found, you tried everything to bring a little bit more, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit in my own words, bring a little bit, you know, or bring the real transparency and accountability and, you know, data transparency into, you know, into this digital world or into the uh, capital investment world. Um, uh, do you think that the, the picture that you've described in your articles, do you think that's just the tip of the iceberg? And uh, yeah, the floor is yours, Elizabeth. Why don't you just tell, uh, tell a little bit my listeners your journey to Bitcoin, uh, you know, what's your background and how do you, you know, well, where do you where do you where do you where are you position right now in the space of Bitcoin? Okay, Thanks. I'll try to I'll try to recap twenty five years very succinctly and by highlighting what I think is most important. Uh, I started working in the financial service industry in nineteen ninety four. That was right before the internet was mainstream. So I'm old enough to have cashed a physical coupon bond uh, in a bank branch, but yet young enough to be interested in the, in the, and picked up on, on Bitcoin. So in between, that's about 25 years and there's a lot of uh, financial, uh, financial innovation. When I started initially, it was really oriented towards the client. It was hurry for the clients. It was like, how can we do more? And it was really about servicing the, the end customer. And it was a, a, a period, a very innovative period, like in the 19, 1990s. Um, and then I uh, saw, so my, my career can be summarized as currently four component, traditional banking online, capital markets, swaps and bonds on the sell side and investments where I distributed both uh, edge funds and exchange traded funds. You alluded to uh, the uh, exchange traded funds at uh, BlackRock also uh, is part of my background. So banking, capital markets and uh, investments. Um, I saw an opportunity in the market to increase transparency for the retail customer because initially it was really about uh, serving the client well. And as I spent uh, about uh, over, over 10 years interacting with the wealth management industry, I thought that there was not enough transparency both on the fees and on the accountability level. So I wanted to develop a, a fintech, uh, like essentially a, a software that would have allowed to quantitatively uh, and objectively um, assess the performance of investment advisors. All that I wanted was to have access to, to the data. And I got confronted to permissioned innovation, which is you need to ask permission to the bankers before you can even develop any products. So obviously it was, I was naive from my part to think that the bankers would be, would accept and welcome transparency on the very thing that their clients pay them to do. So they block the product, they, they block uh, the project and without data, a FinTech cannot, cannot create. So I went to see the regulators and I was also shocked to see that they don't really care and open banking and all those themes, uh, like it's, it's gonna go uh, around and around and around because you need to ask permission to, to innovate. And as I made that realization that there was no way I could be able to empower end customer with its data and with true objective accountability, like quant, quant based accountability, accountability. At the same time, I, I zoomed out and I said, this is a problem that that's not a Canadian problem. It's a global problem. Like it's not done anywhere. And then I started thinking that even if they wanted to, the IT infrastructure of the legacy banking system is, is, is fragmented, inconsistent. And, and it, the backend dates from before internet. So there are limitations, even if they wanted to, there are like uh, technological, there's IT limitations. At the same time, I started uh, studying Bitcoin. 
And when I, when I saw this, this thing, this weird thing, um, I said to myself, whoa, like this is my entire financial career reinvent over, reinvented over there without me even noticing it. And I don't understand it all, but I see something that works. And I see something that really has no use for people like me. It's perfectly fine uh, without any financial people getting involved. So that was very appealing to me because it was um, uh, an opt out and a hope that somewhere there, that permissionless innovation could occur. And to me, Bitcoin was the response to drastic transparency, like to, uh, to, uh, to uh, an elegant solution to drastic transparency, objective truth, mathematics, quantifiable. And so I, uh, I, jumped, I jumped in the proverbial uh, rabbit hole without re even realizing how, how profound, rich, and vast the, 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 the subject is. And that, that's it. That's me. Uh, Few years, a few years later, still absolutely passionate about the about what I'm seeing, and I think it's the fourth, the fourth flag of my uh, financial career, which I uh, think is um, is uh, I, I think Bitcoin is not yet fully understood, but from my personal point of view, the most interesting topic I've I've been able to I'm, I'm grateful to be able to study this and and witness it. Right, right, right. Uh, you know, I was uh, by accident. I, I because I typed in your name into YouTube. I was, you know, look. I was looking for for some interviews, English speaking interviews. So, but there were, I think, all of them, most of them in 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 French on YouTube, at least. You know, I think I knew you have one or two English speaking podcasts you've already done. So it was hilarious because I was watching. I think I, it was sort of a mainstream TV discussion, but put on YouTube, where uh, there was a pretty, you know. Um, uh, you know, a strong discussion going on and you were trying, I don't speak French, but you were trying to explain what Bitcoin is. I think so, you know, and then I think one of the moderators said, uh, interrupted you and said, well, um, I don't understand or something like that in French, you know. <laughs> so how, how systemic is this non-comprehension or do you think it's, it's more ignorance or is it really for the old legacy, old school, you know, macro investors or um, people from the old legacy system is it is it do you think it's hard to understand or you know notwithstanding the fact that it needs time and resources and energy to put into to learn you know to comprehend oh bitcoin is not something you're going to understand in 10 minutes unless mm -hmm. you need it if you if you if you have the luxury of time to say oh yeah blah 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 blah, blah it, yeah it'll, it'll take time to understand like if at least a hundred hours, at least a hundred hours with directed, directed studies, but it's not something like 10 minutes you can, yeah, the 10 minutes thing. Yeah. If you do need to use it, that's as fast as it is to, to set, to set you up. But if you want to, and to, to start using it, it's very fast and easy, but if you want the, 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 to understand all the intricacies and how it works, then it's a, it's a more profound, a more profound research. And yeah. I think that, uh, generally speaking, most people who have a uh, tradition from the legacy system, they're, they're, they're stuck in their rat race. They're running day in, day out. They don't have the time to pause and learn something else. Uh, and I think that the, the narratives are um, narratives and buzzwords are uh, easy to consume and, um, uh, and that the depth of the subject is not fully understood yet. Right, right. No, you're correct. Like understanding how it works, that's a totally different field. But uh, you, uh, I wrote it down a, a couple of points which I want to talk to you about. Um, I mean, when you talk about like monetary properties to you know people and in uh, to investors or legacy people, do they understand the unique monetary properties of Bitcoin, such as you know, uh, as you said, also in the articles, predictability, limited supply, stability, absolute scarcity? I, I I don't think so. And there's 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 two two elements to your question. I think one element has to do with the the common mis misconception or lack of knowledge. I could I could talk about that, and I could talk also about the monetary monetary aspect. Mm -hmm. So which one do you want me to go first? Uh, uh, the the last one the monster the last monster. one okay yeah. <laughs> well it's, it's difficult for people i will separate people between regular people and investment advisor 
because ge generally speaking, like regular people did not receive an education about money or the intricacies of the financial system. And as a matter of fact, like there, you don't learn these things in school and don't even know how to do a budget. So I will, it's, a, it, it, it's just there and they accept it as is and they don't, they don't question it. They don't have the background to. However, an uh, investment advisor did receive an education about money, finance, and they were mostly trained in Keynesian economics. Mm -hmm. That is how fiat currencies are constructed. So concepts of uh, hard and soft money are not part of the classical education curriculum and the gold standard is just not discussed. So the concept of hard money is foreign to most of them. See, after all, the, the fiat monetary system serves the bankers extremely well. So why would they even question it? For example, in, in, in 2008, several banks around the world were bailed out with print, essentially money printing. But, but the layman person, the regular person, did not feel or see this because it did not have an impact on the amount of dollar in the bank statement. They still had the same amount of money in the bank, but the amount of dollar um, uh, was uh, increased because money was debased, which means more, more money printing. And this money was used to save the bankers from, from going under. So the money was taken from the people without people noticing it. So since bankers are making money on money, an investment advisor make money on assets. Post great financial crisis, there was a, a major bull run because there was uh, too much money chasing too few goods. And as a result, the price of asset experienced a steep run up, all favoring bankers and investment advisor. But what the regular people doesn't know is, is the, the, the Cantillon effect, which means like th that money injection doesn't spread evenly and essentially favors those that are closer to the printing machine. So asset go up, but this favors only those who can have assets so, and, and price rise before the rest of the population receives any new money. And for, for that combination of people are not, say the regular people are not educated on money and they don't understand the, say, that, that money has evolved through time and the vested interest of bankers uh, in, in that system. I think that there's what, this is why there's a, um, some, some misconception or, or difficulty to understand uh, money. Uh, and I'm not even, I'm not getting into the, the barter trade and the, 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 the property, the property of money itself. But, um, Money as a protocol uh, is not is not understood. Right. So you said the keyword banks because uh, Tip asked me to t uh, ask you. You know, what do you think about? I mean, you are uh, partially already answered about banks and you know the so-called shit coins, alternative or whatever coins that are that is not Bitcoin. What do you? Well, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the link between banks and shitcoin. I'm not sure what Tib wanted <laughs> no, to make. No, there's no link what's, actually. What's, 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 what's the two, link there? Two different questions, probably. <laughs> but I think there are two different questions. But I, I think, I think where I, I think where he wants to, where the question wants to go is the misconception mm -hmm. and the, the yeah. common misconception. And I think over the, the the past few years, there's there's a lot of new words that came to existence. And I think their propagation has been faster than the understanding of their underlying definition. Mm -hmm. For example, the word blockchain is certainly one very popular. And I have seen countless of pitch decks where decentralization, incorruptibility, and immutability are presented as a fait accompli. And this, this, is, this means that people expect this to be a switch on that you could buy off the shelf. Uh, I think same applies to words such as a digital asset, crypto, crypto asset, cryptocurrencies, tokenization, etc. Uh, overall, I'd say that there's an underappreciation of how Bitcoin works, how it is. And I think until someone has a deep understanding of Bitcoin, it'll be very hard to distinguish with the rest. And the, rate, the risk is to surf on the unsus unsubstantiated yet easy to consume and repeat marketing narratives. So... The, 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 to, to summarize the question, I think that the understanding of the unforgeable costliness and the proof of work at the level where the energy consumption is understood as a feature is not only essential, is desirable. So I would therefore recommend to start learning about this concept before listening to any sales pitch that put ahead concepts of incorruptibility, immutability of digital ledgers.
Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. You made the point. Um, so um, I want to talk to you about a little bit about uh, the fundamental freedoms within Bitcoin. Um, uh, I think there was also this talk about, you know, Bitcoin is text, information, speech. And do you want to talk about like, what is, what is your perspective or position on fundamental freedoms with, uh, of Bitcoin or within Bitcoin or with Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a, is a language. Like it, it communicates. It's, there's, there's no time where it doesn't stop to be text. Like it's, it's, a, it's a way to, to communicate the, our, our, our preference. It's particular properties linked to, to money because it comes, it, it, it is valuable because it comes, the information space come in a limited, limited supply. But it is, is a, a, a communication, how we express, like where people are spontaneously using, like it, it emerge. Um, and, and yes, it has a ramification to uh, fundamental, uh, fundamental uh, human rights. It's, it's the sovereignty over over money and it's um it's a it's a it's a deep topic i recommend right. on, on on that uh, there's a, a um, an author i very respect his work is uh, the avatar name is beauty on oh yeah all okay. beauty on beauty on's work uh, is uh, i haven't read it all but what i've read from him i think he's uh the the fundamentals are there mm -hmm. Uh, do you think that people, whatever background they have, like have a different, uh, like a difficulty understanding or comparing like uh, a purely digital or virtual gold, uh, as I would call Bitcoin, uh, with absolute scarcity versus um, either, you know, physical gold or this, uh, the centralized fiat money? Because most people think, you know, it's, I mean, the fiat money by itself is, is, is digital. But what most people I think don't understand is that it's purely centralized. So what's the differentiation? Do you think, or do people make differentiation? Do, what's their, what's their comprehension process? Do you think? Are you asking me to contrast fiat money, gold, and Bitcoin? Uh, not you, but what do you think? What people have difficulty understanding them, you know, when it comes to the monetary properties, you know, absolute scarcity, but because you know, Bitcoin is purely digital, virtual versus other, you know, let's say hard hard money like like gold, like you know, because we, we used to have a gold standard, but that's a long time ago. Um, so. Um, well, it's, I think I think people have difficulty understanding money in the first place, so that's why these concepts can be uh, can be uh, can be foreign, and um, th like money in the bank account is just entries in a da database, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the the physical the physical money. I've seen uh, there's a Quebec economist who ex who did in a mainstream media an opinion where he's a PhD, and he said. And, and that, that, that adds to the public, public confusion. He said, $20 will always be $20 because it's backed by the central bank. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like that's the, the nominal value. Like, yeah, that's, that's the face value. But $20 in the 70s was probably buying grocery for four people for a week. And now you can barely get a steak for $20. So, so understanding the nominal, the real, the purchasing power, the, the limited supply is, um, or, or uh, how things work is, is not easily accessible. Uh, but the, the, the price, the, the, the inflation component in the, in the asset um, is, uh, is, is experienced, maybe not understood, but people, people see it. Uh, as far as contrasting the properties between Bitcoin and gold, I think it's important to understand that the uh, and that the, um, gold has ornamental usage and industrial usage, um, but its value is significantly more than that. And it is, as you can see from uh, an ETF such as GLD in the US, where they claim to have physical gold backing backing the ETF. Uh, and, and if I contrast with, with Bitcoin, I think that um, there's a case to be made that Bitcoin is even rarer than gold because there's no, there's no potential to find the, 
new Bitcoin out of nowhere or dig a hole somewhere where there's new Bitcoin or receive a meteorite where there's new gold on top of it. Like there's no unexpected supply. I think it's, it's more transportable, meaning that uh, if you want to carry, uh, I'm saying a hundred million worth of gold, like it's going to take trucks and it's going to be uh, heavy to, to transport. And, and Bitcoin is digitally native. It, right. is, it, it, it was born in the digital, so it can be cryptographically verified. It is cheap to produce, it is expensive to produce and cheap to verify. It is programmable. And these are features that gold doesn't, doesn't have. Right. And then there are some other points like uh, the, the potential risk or danger of confiscatability or assaying, validating the purity of gold. I mean, we were not there yet where everybody, I mean, could have maybe an app <laughs> or some kind of, you know, small high-tech device to validate or assay the, the purity of, of the gold. And then how do you use it in medium exchange to the gro by the grocery store? You know, so all these things, I think are- All these things, but, but to, to, verify, to verify the gold, the uh, jewel, jewel make, jewelry maker have a little uh, liquid and they, you, there's a little, uh, there's a little trick where you can you can test the purity of uh, of gold and tell you if it's uh, how refined mm -hmm. the, the gold is. But you're absolutely true that if if you go for a big big size, what what what, what how do you confirm that you don't have tungsten brick? Uh, gold-plated tungsten brick, you know, it's and it's the, the counterfeit, counterfeitability. And then when you use a financial product, how do you audit that there's truly all the gold that they see there is? So it's a uh, with with Bitcoin, don't trust, verify. It's cryptographically verifiable, and I think there are properties to Bitcoin that are not not yet fully understood or appreciated. Right. And we already had those cases, right? Where we had tungsten or it was just not pure. I mean, these things are like, I don't know, in the practical day-to-day -day life, uh, sure, you know, we could go to a high tech uh, or, uh, you know, to a gold merchant and he, I'm, I'm sure they have all these high tech devices. But anyway, it's just a lot of obstacles and, and challenges when it comes to gold. And for me, I mean, for, for me personally, I think the absolute transparent, uh, absolute scarcity uh, of Bitcoin and of course, transparency versus the, the relative scarcity is one of the key features, one of the mo you know, unique features of Bitcoin. Would you agree I with agree. that? Yeah, I yeah. agree with that. So um, you also talked in your articles about disruptive technologies. Um, do you think that the problems, the, the really root problems are so systemic in the financial, you know, capital investment world that it's just really difficult to integrate this into the old system. So there is no, as Buckminster Fuller said, you know, we have to create new structures and systems mm -hmm. somehow like that in order to make the old ones obsolete. How, how bad is it? I mean, well, I, I okay. I, I rarely talk about shit coins, but then I have no choice but to talk about shit coins to uh, to illustrate to yeah. illustrate a point. And I'm not a big fan of that. Okay, but I I will use that to illustrate a point. There was a, an ICO initial coin offering bubble uh, attached to a blockchain bubble, like where there was lots of capital. The, the 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 only nice thing I can say about that whole era is that some if if you remove like the 95 percent the scams and like the wild west this was i think in, the, the legit entrepreneurs sent a message to securities regulators saying we want to operate globally and there is no global mechanism for uh, uh crowdfunding so so what i'm trying to say is uh, when you look at the, the the ecosystem and how our world are the digitalized right now spontaneous team can form uh, with like-minded individual who want to create and develop and it doesn't matter where you are like you may be in Austria would have someone from Texas and then uh, me and me in Canada and having someone from the, the, where, wherever in the world but how do we form capital how do we get organized with, while being with our respective regulation so where where your question is how is like innovation permissible possible 
when you have so many individual regulatory bodies in all the individual jurisdiction with all each people having to justify their work and they will all want to have a say it's 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 a no-go zone it will never happen even if the sec like last week uh, Astor, uh, commissioner esther pierce suggested like a three three year um grace period well it, it, even there like that's that's just the sec it's another way of permissioning like decide deciding ahead of time who will be the winner and the losers and that's that's not right that's not our innovation you cannot have true innovation when you permission permission the thing mm -hmm. uh, i think investor protection uh, consumer protection is very important i don't want to dismiss that because there was lots of uh, scams and s stupid things but but but, but then on the other hand, you said in your article, the regulators just don't care. I mean, it seems to be right. They don't well, care. <laughs> let me let me uh, let yeah. me try to put the things uh, in perspective and uh, offer a, a very uh, direct. Uh, hold on, let me just find one thing. Sorry for the interruption, because I have no, this. No. Because you also talked in the context of no no full fee transparency. There is a lot of complexity made to look, uh, you know, whoever well, these, these agents me, uh, like let, look let smart. Me, let me walk you through the mm -hmm. fintech strategy. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm taking just this macro big picture without going into any specifics. Okay, thing is, if you look at the ecosystem, uh, okay, let's say fintech wants to do a strategy as an idea. Great. Uh, regulators are paid in the equivalent of billable hours. Mm -hmm. So they have a vested interest in studying, consulting, doing more consulting, roundtables, invitation to discuss stakeholders, blah, blah, blah. This goes around for years. Mm -hmm. There's no accountability. It goes around for years. And then zoom that at all the individual region, all the individual regulators. It's insane. Then bankers profit bank bankers profit from this because it, well at least in my in my region it's an oligopoly like there are other regions where um it's the the barriers to entries are, are are lower but in in my region and i think in the uk it's the same there are few dominant players so the dominant players that when there's oligopolies oligopoly monopo monopolistic uh, cartel like uh, environment they profit so they have they benefit from the opacity and the length. The, the, so both regulators and bankers have the, a common vested interest of just slowing things down. Yet the, the end customer has no transparency. To, in, in Canada, I, I, I find it funny that there are more regulatory bodies for financial institution than there are financial institution to choose from by a multiple. There are more regulators than there are bankers. It's, it's crazy. Incredible, incredible. So, so when, so end customer do not have transparency because it, and, and FinTech who wants to innovate must ask permission, but then try to do something global. You will have to ask like international permission. There's probably like 86 trillion, 345, 62 with the individual regular regulation. It makes absolute no sense. So the, the administrative burden, the incentive to slow things down equals fintechs can't win. They can't create. And, and that's why I was really ripe when I heard about Bitcoin and Vires and Numeris, don't trust, verify, do your own research. I was, I was just right. And I uh, invite the fintechs who are frustrated and they, can, they realize that they can't create in the legacy system to join Bitcoin. And there are spontaneous, spontaneous teams around the world. So, and, and it's the most interesting topic ever. May this fail? Yeah, but uh, I think it's quite advanced. I think it's quite advanced, quite unique and underappreciated. And I think that um, uh, this couldn't be created from within. It had to come from without. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, because innovators dilemma, like if you're sitting on, a, on this massive status quo and you have a big check that comes in every two weeks, you have no, no incentive to disrupt any of this. You just want things to continue very, the, the, way, the way they were. And that's why innovation inevitably comes from outside, I think. Mm -hmm. What do you think, what conditions uh, 
should happen and there are you know there is a, a high probability you know said by experts that uh, you know whether there's going to be a crash or you know bank insolvency uh, uh, in Europe in 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 Germany uh, or maybe even you know because of external conditions whatever that is you know uh, uh, do you think um, the old structure could become by itself obsolete because I see no other way. I mean, I mean, when we look at the structural problems, uh, beginning with the Bank for International Settlement, central banks, banks, you know, the financial industry, it just, it's so compartmentalized and so complex or made so complex, as you say, you know, um, that we have, I, I, I see no other choice than to, to, uh, to create or, or that sort of spontaneous emergence of, uh, circular economy, circular financial industry within and on Bitcoin. Uh, do you do you know what I'm saying? Like where I'm going with this? Like it, like to make the old structures obsolete, we, there is no other choice than to create new structures on and within Bitcoin. Uh, does that make sense? What I'm saying? I, I, no, I I agree. I agree with you, and I think from a, a macro perspective, it's very 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 interesting times, and. Bitcoin is, is all in one payment technology, savings technology, embedded currency, global, 24-7, uh, provisional, it's, it's all that. And when you look at the legacy system, which is not yet understood by everyone as the legacy system, but it's antiquated, fragmented, slow, uh, and with uh, a monetary system that leads to boost and bust cycles. So if, even if you remove the existence of Bitcoin as an alternative, to, to that, I think that they, the, the, the fiatist or the monetary, the regular monetary system will continue to do what it does. It'll pump money until it breaks. And I don't know how long this can take, but it is the, 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 the destination that's been seen many times in the previous uh, boost and bust. And I think that the, 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 the central bankers and all the nomenclatures for pro money printing is not as effective as they would have liked. They're not meeting their inflation target, no matter no matter the existence of Bitcoin. Like if you remove that and you just look like it's it's their their means are not working anymore, and I think they have a, a, a conundrum. Um, then at the end of last year, Christine Lagarde, a uh, few days before she became the president of the ECB, the European Central Bank, said something. Uh, Quite harsh in defense of negative interest rates. You said that people should be happier to have a job than to have savings rates. I was like, oh whoa, 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 whoa. That's, that's, I, that's an illustration of the severity yeah. of the situation. We couldn't believe and, what we were hearing. It was just incredible. It was like, you know, subservient. We are subservient slaves. We should be thankful, you know, to have a, to have a job at least. You know, so, I mean, it's... <laughs> well, it, it, it didn't, that, that comment didn't really resonate very well with me. But, but when I look at Europe, I see that the ne ne negative in, in German banks are negative interest rate is like yeah. a direct money confiscation. Mm -hmm. And it's not at all a good sign because negative interest rate can accelerate the very problem it's trying to solve. And it's legalized and theft, right, Elizabeth? I mean, this is, it, it, I mean, there's no it's other money word. confiscation. There's no, it's, 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 it's money confiscation right so but this this uh will accelerate like the more negative you go right people will pull their money out of the bank and will look for alternative which will fuel art assets and, and so on and so forth so it's it's not it's really not uh, positive but but all these tools which includes negative interest rate qe liquidity injection etc it all means the same thing money printing and this is just a normal trajectory of the fiat money system what I don't know is uh, how much external shocks it can withhold because what I mean is the fiat monetary system is debt based for it to work. Growth mm. is needed. Mm. And there's one current area of concern uh, that could bring the, the perfect storm. Uh, it's the corona virus. Yeah, I was going to mention that, but I thought, you know, let's leave it out. It might, might make things well, complicated. But yeah, well, I mean, I mean, well, it's already well, happening. It's already happening. The trade, yeah. I mean, uh, trade and, 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 and commerce. And it's just, it's just. It well, just, here are the, the here, here's the angle with coronavirus and the monetary policy mm -hmm. and the, 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 the digital currency where I see this all links together. Um, I think first, in terms of uh, economic growth, uh, I think we'll be real, uh, real life stress testing the supply chain 
So this may create an economic slowdown in both China and its international trading partners. The debt is to be seen, but again, the monetary system needs growth. Uh, second, there's, there's another uh, element this time is it, it can be the perfect storm to force people uh, by, uh, to adopt the, the digital one. The central, uh, China has been for a long time rumored to be working on central bank digital currency and they already have this digital closed end loop ecosystem. And now since the virus can live up to nine days, what a great, what a great culprit to blame for not using paper notes anymore and, to, right. onboard, yeah. and to onboard people. Uh, so I think central banks around the world for different reasons are realizing this and uh, it has a major impact on geopolitics and money pol monetary policy transmission. So um, we, we don't know yet the, uh, the net net. It doesn't change the underlying fundamental difference between soft and hard money. Mm -hmm. But I think it changes uh, lots of things from a technological point of view, political and a political global form of money, and also uh, the, just how we live, like uh, to the, the data generated with, uh, with money. So that uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss the coronavirus and, uh, and, and link to central bank digital currency uh, faster on board, faster on boarding than, than expected. Okay, so we're on the same page. <laughs> uh, I wrote a couple of quotes. Uh, banks have an implicit kill switch on innovative projects. So it's a, and it's a, and mm -hmm. you said it's a profound ethical matter. So yeah, you touched on, uh, on that uh, already. I think making complexity look smart, and um, yeah. So we're already uh, almost at the end. Do you want to like? Um, um, is there anything? Um, I don't, we don't want any, you know, we, don't, we can't make predictions, but where do you see in the next five to 10 years uh, the, the ecosystem around and within Bitcoin or where do you see Bitcoin in five to 10 years? Oh, Bitcoin in five to 10 years, I predict, I think it will be uh, well and alive. It will have evolved. There will be more services uh, created and uh, lots of cool things. There'll be lots of cool things. Uh, Bitcoin, that uh, an antiquated pre-internet backend fragmented financial system cannot offer. I think that the millennials are uh, getting more, um, are, are, are aging. Millennials mm -hmm. are aging and they're getting into their, their, the place of their career where they have uh, energy and uh, desire, desire to build. And I think there will be uh, lots, lots of cool things um, happening in the, uh, in the ecosystem. In terms of services to, uh, to, to 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 serve people who want to use and want to use Bitcoin, and it can transform. They want once you have a new form of money, uh, then you can develop business around uh, that new form of money to to receive, to exchange, to to scale, uh, uh, and uh, so on, so so on, so forth. I think this innovation can occur. Uh, mm -hmm. um, um do you see like in the next uh, decades to come, I mean, we, we, most probably, you know, nation states per se, or governments, um, central banks will not be totally obsolete, probably, I don't know, maybe I mean, it could happen, but do you see something really transformational structurally from within? It's too big of a call for me to make. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the entrenched interest of, uh, Lots of time to waste and mm. lots of money to waste and lots of anecdotes, lots of vested interest for, for things to stay. But what I think could accelerate the, the onboarding is um, external shocks, right? Mm. Like uh, external shocks, uh, the because then the and the, the populism, both right and left, like what, what it does, the money printing helps those that are closer to the money printing. Mm -hmm. And this has an impact on the rest of the people. So thinking that this is going to go on and uh, they're going to, oh yeah, they're going to print money and then inflate asset and uh, do negative interest rates and people to, to start, start losing their job and stuff like that. It's going to go uh, all lovey-dovey. I don't think so. And, mm -hmm. and some of the people may in time say, okay, what was, why didn't you, why didn't you tell me about Bitcoin? <laughs> oh, well, what is this again? Like you told me that this was a, a Ponzi scheme. Well, I, can we get, can we review the definition of a Ponzi scheme? Cause that doesn't seem right. Uh, right. right. So, so I think people will be, will be asking questions. And I think uh, they, from what I'm observing, there's a, a very, um, 
there's very smart people involved in Bitcoin and hardworking, hardworking people that are absolutely passionate. And uh, they're, 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 they're yeah, I'm happy to see I'm really fortunate. It's fortunate, fortunate enough. There's like, you know, really, I mean, maybe, I mean, um, I don't know. I see only a handful of people like you coming from the legacy or macro investors like, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, like Raul Paul and uh, Tim Draper, I think it's his name. Or, you know, like mm -hmm. there is not so many people right now in, you know, in, in the macro investment world, financial world that really grasp the bigger picture and the essence and the implications of Bitcoin uh, for, you know, well, globally. Oh, there, there are, there are some, there are some, yeah. and, I, and I've identified, I've identified a few other, uh, a few other CFA charter holders like myself who took the time, like uh, to, who took the time to to form a, to form an opinion. Mm -hmm. But it is not. It, we we're, uh, I have long, long studies, and I am by I'm by design a uh, or by 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 training a, an analyst. So I mm -hmm. need to understand the various parts and it takes, it takes a long time to really study the parts. And I don't think legacy finance people have that time or that luxury because they're, they're running in their rat race and they have dismissed the phenomenon because they were told that it was about blockchain and Bitcoin is bad and blockchain is good. And I think they were, they were misled from, from the start. So let's not lose hope that traditional finance people will uh, um, get to an understanding and understanding of that, but it's not going to happen by uh, by magic, right? Right, right. Doesn't happen. So finance people, it doesn't happen by um, osmosis. They will they will need to invest uh, and invest time. Mm -hmm. Since you're your analyst, I mean, what do you think? Just uh, for co uh, for conclusion, what do you think about uh, what what is the the halfings, uh, the stock to flow ratio? Do you have like uh, like do you want to like give a brief opinion? Like, what do you think gonna do to to the Bitcoin price? In um, oh, I don't, I don't comment. I don't comment on price. I don't okay. comment on, on price. the hardness. Uh, hardness. Uh, <laughs> uh, on the hardness. Well, look, look, look at the stock to flow ratio. If you understand that, then the mm -hmm. the logical conclusions should come naturally. Okay. Good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Fascinating. Okay, Elizabeth. Um, I'm pretty much finished with my questions. Do you have anything else important for my listeners that you know you want to direct them to? I mean, I already uh, recommended to my listeners to definitely read your articles. It's really super succinctly written and and for comprehension, it's like super easy to get into like the bigger picture. Uh, is there anything like your uh, any informational sources resources you want to direct? Well, I, I have a, I have a weekly newsletter that I write every Saturday or Sunday, depending on how my weekend how my weekend goes. So it's a it's a a, a weekly newsletter where I uh, comment on uh, stuff and uh, share links I found pertinent in my weekly uh, weekly reading. So it's one it's 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 free and it's available to whoever wants to receive. Uh, ideas content content ideas and also on my uh, on, the, on my website when i produce a new blog post i uh, also uh, advertise them on my uh, weekly weekly newsletter i would also say to those who deal with financial advisor i would say uh, keep keep the answers closely to when you've asked about bitcoin and keep keep the answers you received uh, somewhere uh, it will be uh, interesting to look at, interesting to look at them in a few years time yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. I hope to get you back soon and hope to see you maybe, uh, I know it's, it didn't work out maybe for the uh, Value of Bitcoin Symposium in Vienna, but, but I'm sure Daniel Wingen of the Value of Bitcoin Conference, he uh, was going to get in touch with you uh, regarding uh, June uh, Value of Bitcoin Conference. So hopefully we're going to see each other and have a maybe personal podcast with, you know, with my professional equipment. Uh, <laughs> and, and yeah, thank you so much for your, you know, sharing your knowledge and your expertise with all of us. Thank you for your time. It was a pleasure. Thank all you. Right. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. What you make of this? It was really, really enjoyed our talk with um, Elizabeth Prefontaine of Octonomics.com. Check out her website on Octonomics.com. Uh, subscribe to her newsletter and uh, check out on, on Twitter. Uh, it's, uh, the Twitter handle is E-P-R-E-F-O-N, Eprefon. And yeah, if you have any questions, please write me an email to hello at the totalconnector.com. Please share, like, subscribe, follow me. Also do that uh, uh, for Elizabeth Prefontaine. Uh, she's got really uh, highly valuable 
knowledge and and information and research done and it's uh, it's it's really worth um, every every second you would spend on reading these uh beautiful articles anyway um thank you so much for supporting for listening and i'll talk to you soon again bye bye